Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts, a free educational netcast bringing geology to all. As a kid watching old reruns of the television show Beverly Hillbillies, I was always confused by the intro sequence, which seemed to suggest that, that Jed Clampett is somehow shooting the ground, and that causes the oil to flow out which isn't a thing, actually. That's not how oil behaves, and that's not how you explore for petroleum, or as he called it, Black Gold, Texas Tea. Petroleum is a fossil fuel, and like other fossil fuels, coal and natural gas, they are literally fossils. They are the remains of ancient life forms that have been preserved in sedimentary rock over time, and by heat and pressure and slow chemical reactions over geologic time, have been rendered down not to a fossil we can recognize as an individual fossil of a shell or something like that, but as a material, a bulk material, made up of the rendered residue of trillions of organisms, in this case plankton. Petroleum largely comes from plankton. It comes from the ocean. Warm tropical seas, sunlit waters, where there's lots of growth, lots of plankton, phytoplankton, algae, perhaps a river depositing into the ocean. Uh, sort of like the Gulf of Mexico, which is a petroleum-producing region. Petroleum is forming right now at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, where the Mississippi River has dumped out, and continues to dump out, immense volumes of sediment from the land surface, from the continent, mixed with plant remains. Dead leafy material, bits of dead tree and root, as well as soil material. And this stuff, when trapped with the plankton of the Gulf of Mexico, trapped in sediments as they settle to the bottom, as they collect up, as they become progressively buried in the sediment. Time, pressure, and eventually heat begins to alter this material and break it down. The cell walls, cell membranes of microbes, of plankton, of algae trapped in that sediment are going to rot, but in the absence of air. In the absence of oxygen, it's anaerobic decomposition instead of aerobic. Aerobic decomposition would have turned that stuff back into CO2 in the atmosphere if it had had a chance to rot at the Earth's surface. But if this algae and plant material is trapped in sediments away from oxygen, it will rot by anaerobic bacteria, decomposing it, taking their food value from it, and breaking the material down in the process from what started out as carbohydrates, lipids, starches in the biomass, is altered and rendered down to simpler compounds that contain only carbon and hydrogen, for the most part. We call these hydrocarbons. A carbon bonded to another carbon bonded to another carbon in a long chain, where the extra bonds are all taken up with hydrogens or branch off to other carbon chains. And that's what petroleum is. Mature petroleum is a mixture of hundreds of different hydrocarbon molecules of varying lengths. That is, they have different numbers of carbons in those chains. A hydrocarbon can be as simple as methane. One carbon surrounded by four hydrogens, not bonded to anything else, and of course, methane is the principal component of natural gas, another major fossil fuel. Longer hydrocarbon chains with two, three, four, six carbons, eight carbons, longer, form the rest of the petroleum mix. And as the hydrocarbon chain gets longer, it becomes less like methane, which is a gas at room temperature. It becomes heavy enough that it doesn't easily evaporate, and at room temperature might be a liquid, or at room temperature might even be a gel or a solid. And we make a lot of use out of all these different hydrocarbons in petroleum. And I'll come back to that, but one of the principal importances of petroleum is not just a place you get gasoline, but it's a material that, from which you get a lot of stuff that performs a lot of functions in our civilization. But it starts off as plankton. It starts off as algae in warm, sunlit, tropical water. And if you look today at where petroleum is forming, it is in marine ocean habitats where there's lots of river bringing material in, or there's lots of planktonic growth and algae flourishing in the waters as this stuff settles to the bottom is the source material for petroleum. If you look at places today that have a lot of petroleum but don't look like that, it's because it looked like that a long time ago. The Middle East, famously, much of which is hot, dry, desert sand, was not that way when the petroleum underneath its sands was forming. It was a warm, tropical, watery environment, a marine setting with lots of sunlight and lots of planktonic growth. That's why today, those sediments still lay down in the rock, and they still trap the fossilized, in this case as petroleum, remains of plankton from long ago. So when you're looking for petroleum, geologically, 
you're prospecting for sedimentary layers that used to be at the bottom of the ocean, or a shallow sea on the continental shelf to be more specific. But you're looking for sediments that collected on the continental shelf in ocean waters, sometimes lakes, but usually ocean. And that's why you can't find petroleum just anywhere. Petroleum famously is restricted to some deposits in some parts of the world. It's a geopolitical strategy business dealing with petroleum. The reason for that is it doesn't form everywhere. It only forms where the conditions are right, where you have warm tropical waters and lots of time for sediment with plankton at the bottom. And those conditions don't exist everywhere. And they also don't exist for very long when they do. So petroleum deposits tend to be scattered around the world very unevenly, but it's simply because of the geologic history involved in their formation. The process of turning all that plankton and plant material into petroleum, the chemical process itself, is fairly complicated. But for our purposes here, I can simplify it to essentially two primary processes, converting fresh biomass into, over geologic time, into petroleum. The first part of this process is what we call diagenesis. Diagenesis is a general term. It doesn't apply just to petroleum formation. Diagenesis means everything that happens to sediments after they're buried. Fresh sediment being buried by sediment that deposits later above it, and then it's compressed down, the water is pushed and driven out, the grains are pushed together, and the biomass in there is rendered down at first by other bacteria, by anaerobic decomposition, anaerobic bacteria in the absence of air. And this will take apart a lot of the complicated biological materials in those cells and render it down to simpler compounds not quite hydrocarbons yet. At this point, we form kerogen. Kerogen is something I've mentioned in a previous episode. It is the dark residue of organic matter you can see in, say, a black shale. If you open up the layers of a black shale, if you look at a sample of it, it's dark, it's black with organic matter in the rock. It's mixed in, embedded with the sedimentary mineral and rock particles. And kerogen is not a very good fuel because it tends to be fairly distributed. Uh, black shale may only contain a few percent organic matter as kerogen. We don't really use that as a fuel directly. However, kerogen is the result of diagenesis. Catagenesis follows diagenesis. At geologic depths of about two kilometers, about 2,000 meters deep, and temperatures ranging around 50 to 60 Celsius, up to those temperature conditions and pressure conditions, that's when diagenesis takes place and you're forming kerogen from organic matter. At higher temperatures, going up to about 90, 100, 110 Celsius, at depths of down around three or four kilometers. Under those conditions, catagenesis takes over and mature petroleum can eventually form. Now, interestingly, petroleum is not a particularly stable material, and if you go outside of those temperature conditions, you can destroy it. In fact, those conditions that I just described, depths of around two to four kilometers, temperatures around 60 to maybe 110, 120 Celsius, that's what geologists call the oil window. If you bury petroleum deeper than about four kilometers, and if temperatures go above about 120 Celsius, you're outside the oil window, and the oil will begin to crack. Cracking is a term that's used to describe when a heavy, large hydrocarbon molecule is essentially broken. You break it in half, or you break it into smaller pieces, forming smaller hydrocarbon molecules with their own different properties. So if you had, say, a hydrocarbon chain 30 carbons long, and you cracked it, you could break it into two chains of 15 carbons each, or something like that. The conditions are going to vary. But essentially, when you start heating petroleum up above the oil window, the hydrocarbons begin to crack into smaller and smaller chains, and eventually forming natural gas. Petroleum will break down under high enough temperature conditions down in the crust, eventually cracking all the way into just natural gas. Simple hydrocarbon molecules of a few carbons in length and nothing greater than that. So petroleum doesn't last forever. If there are cracks or fissures present or the rock is simply porous, oil will migrate from its source rock to other rock formations. The source rock is actually the name that geologists give to a layer of strata that when it forms, forms with enough organic matter that it will eventually produce oil. It will produce petroleum eventually, but oil rarely stays in its source rock unless there is an impermeable barrier directly above it. Oil is a lot lighter than the rock around it. It's lighter than water even. And so if there are any fractures, cracks, or faults present, or the rock is simply porous enough, it will migrate upward under less and less pressure. It's trying to seek lower pressure because it's buoyant. 
compared to the material that surrounds it and cases it. So if there's actually an, a conduit to the surface, oil will migrate all the way up to the surface. There are many examples of this in the world today, most famous in the United States perhaps being the La Brea Tar Pits in California, where that is a deposit of petroleum that has found a conduit to reach the surface, and the lightest hydrocarbons just evaporate out and leave behind just the heavier residues, the heavier hydrocarbons that are more like tar. Because petroleum moves, it makes it particularly difficult to deal with as a geologic resource, because you can't just map to the stratum of its source rock and expect to find it there. You should expect that it's going to move around. And so oil exploration has always been a risky business about trying to sink wells, hoping that you'll find a deposit of petroleum, but not being entirely sure. Because unlike coal or any other form of solid rock, petroleum is a liquid and will move around, and it's not clear sometimes where it has moved to from its original source rock. And so that's why geologists have, over time, tended to look for what we call structural traps. It's a trap! Arrangements of geologic strata and rock formations in the subsurface that tend to form a natural barrier to the oil in such a way that it will prevent the oil from moving anywhere else. One classic example of this is what we call an anticlinal trap. That is, a trap of oil underneath an anticline, a natural bend or fold in the rock that produces almost like a dome shape. If oil is migrating upward from beneath the strata of one of these anticlinal structures, then it will eventually reach an impenetrable layer in the anticline and will simply pool there. And geologists who are looking for oil, if they can identify this kind of structure and know that there are strata beneath it that are oil-bearing or are likely to be, that's where you might send down a few test drill holes to find if there's oil there. Another kind of structural trap is what we would call a fault trap. That is, a natural structure where a fault has shifted the layers, and now the oil in the source rock, as it moves upward, encounters a shifted layer of impenetrable rock that it can't get past, and the oil will pool there as well. Another common kind of trap is underneath a salt dome. A salt dome is what happens when you have a layer of evaporite material, rock salt, among layers of other sediment. Rock salt is a pretty low-density rock, and it can actually deform and be driven upward by its own buoyancy if the layers of rock it's surrounded by are soft enough to allow it to do this. What happens when a mass of salt rises in a dome like that is it's pushing the sediment ahead of it to some degree and out of the way. And on the flanks below the uppermost bulge of the salt dome are areas where, where oil can pool because salt is not particularly porous. It's soft, but it doesn't really easily allow oil to flow through. So salt domes are classic form of structural trap that geologists have looked for for a long time. Once we have petroleum, we do a lot with it. It's not like coal that is essentially just burned for electricity. With petroleum, you take full advantage of the fact that there's a wide variety of different compounds dissolved in the mixture, and we separate them by temperature. Raw crude oil during distillation and refinement is heated up to high temperatures, four or 500 Celsius, in the absence of air, so it doesn't burn. Under these conditions, most of petroleum becomes a vapor, except for the very largest hydrocarbon molecules of greater than 80 carbons or so, which fall out pretty soon to become roofing tar and road asphalt. Slightly smaller hydrocarbon molecules, around 70 carbons or so, fall out from the distillation process, giving you paraffin wax, candle making, fuel oil for ships, and fuel oil for large power stations. As the petroleum vapor cools down through about 350 Celsius, separated out from the mixture are motor oil, industrial lubricants. As you go down to lower temperatures, below 350C, down to about 260 Celsius, hydrocarbons of about 16 to 60 carbons come out of the refining process. And you get a wide range of stuff at this point. Light lubricants, diesel fuel, gas oils, petroleum jelly, and other hydrocarbon compounds of low utility value that are cracked into smaller hydrocarbons of greater value. At temperatures ranging from about 260 Celsius down to about 180, light hydrocarbons of about 10 to 16 carbons in length fall out of the refinement. This is where you get jet fuel, home heating fuel, kerosene. Below 180 Celsius down to about 30 Celsius, a range of hydrocarbons come out, including the major components of gasoline. And at that point, you're talking about hydrocarbons that are light enough to be pretty volatile. That is, they evaporate very easily. If you go to smaller hydrocarbons, from one to four carbons in length, things that condense out, it's lower than 30 Celsius or so, you get natural gas, 
light fuel gases like propane, butane. So at the end of the day, essentially every part of petroleum is used, and it's not just for fuel, as I said. A lot of it is used to produce plastics, specialty compounds, industrial manufacturing goods, and the list goes on from there, and it's a long list.